Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, today is November 3rd, uh, and I hope everybody made it through Hurricane Zeta intact. Uh, I want to remind everybody that we are working on Module 5, and the quiz will open this Thursday. So if you have any questions on that or any concerns, by all means, just get in touch with me. Uh, and also with your exams, uh, I have them right here. And I'll pass them back in class, but of course, if you're not here in class, uh, you'll need to get in touch with me, but you can check online and see what your grade is. Uh, but let's go ahead and get started. Uh, when we last left off, we were talking about slavery in the South and how slavery is going to become even more of an ingrained institution in the South as a result of the cotton industry, but also how it was a lot more complex than just simply people owning slaves and growing cotton. There was a, a system involved, and, and we talked about how a plantation worked with, with an overseer and drivers, and everybody on the plantation has a different role to play, and how slavery itself is baked into every economic aspect of this country. You know, there's factories, there's insurance companies, there's banks. It's a big part of how America operates. I want to briefly talk about industry and the North. I want to talk about the North now. Let's go north of the Ohio River and into places like New England. The Industrial Revolution took hold in Europe in the late 18th century. You know, roughly the 1770s, 1780s is when we see the first signs of industry. And as we move into the 1800s, Europe, particularly Western Europe, is going to become highly industrialized, starting with the textile industry making clothes, but moving into iron and all types of other products. Now, the United States is kind of slow to adopt industry. You know, we're a little late to the game, but America will become an industrialized nation. The first factories in the United States popped up in the 18 teens and actually the first location for factories was Lowell, Massachusetts and these factories were built based on designs stolen from British factories and these were textile mills and they again they produced clothing now, the United States has an absolutely gigantic potential for industry. You know, all of the raw materials we have are large population, plenty of space. But the one shortcoming, the one challenge was raising the capital, the money needed to build these factories, the money needed to invest in this. Factories make a lot of money, but it takes a lot of money to get them built. And at this time, America is just not a wealthy nation. And so that's what's really holding the United States back. Nevertheless, the wheels do start turning. By the 1820s, we start to see textile factories growing in places like Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, New York. And this will eventually create an event we call the market revolution where America really begins to embrace capitalism and the free market economy. And America will eventually become a gross exporter of industrialized goods. Now, this, this happens slowly. This happens slowly. It's important to keep in mind that if we take a snapshot, and I do like snapshots, of the year 1820, 97% of the American population are rural farmers, 97%. Only 3% of the population did not fall into that category. But by the time we get to 1920, more Americans live in cities than in the country. So America over a hundred year period migrates to the city with an awful lot of these people taking up industrial jobs as industry grows. Now, the market revolution is gonna revolutionize how Americans live, and a lot of it has to do with technology. 
For example, America is going to undergo a transportation revolution. We talked about this already. Railroads, steamships, canals. People and, of course, the goods they produce can now be moved very efficiently across the country and, more importantly, to the ocean to be exported. This brings in wealth. It obviously incentivizes land development because the more food you grow, the more you can sell, the more cotton you grow, the more you can send off. It gives people the ability to go places, experience new things, meet new people, become educated, learn new skills. This market revolution also involves commercialization. We see the formation of corporations, investment, educated businessmen building companies that make a lot of money. And once these businessmen are rich, they have a lot of influence too. This is what Andrew Jackson was so concerned about and the Democrats were so concerned about. The raising of capital to build factories or invest in canals or railroads now becomes a big part of what America does. And cities like New York become financial centers. A man by the name of John Jacob Astor made an absolute fortune. And all he really did was raise capital. You know, if you have the idea of building a factory and you people over here have money to invest, Astor was the middleman and he would arrange all of you to come in and form the company and then you invest and build the factory. And he was sort of the man pulling the strings on all of it and he gets his cut of everything. And he became phenomenally wealthy and very influential because, of course, he could get any congressman or any senator on the line just like that. And they would listen to what he had to say because if you want a factory in your area, you better make him happy. You get the idea. And you can understand why this concerns President Jackson, you know, why he saw this as something that we need to be very troubled by. These factories are going to directly challenge the cottage industry that had made America so prosperous up to that point. Farmers in the countryside, for example, were frequently paid to hand make textiles. You know, somebody will drop off a bunch of raw material and old McDonald and his family will turn them into shirts and pants and such, in addition to farming their crops. And that was a way to make a little bit of extra money. Well, you can't do that anymore if there's a factory up the street that's doing it now. And of course, the skilled craftsmen that make things like furniture or horseshoes or whatever it is, you know, cities like Boston and New York had all kinds of skilled workers in them. And factories will eventually challenge their lifestyles as well. So this is a, this is a change. This is a change. We will see the emergence of an industrial working class. People that live in cities, but live on industrial wages, which means they're poor. And by the 1840s and 1850s, we see what we would call industrial slums. Big crowded areas where lots of people are packed in and they go to these factories every day to work. And to be honest with you, life really isn't all that good for them. It's a hard life. And these people will eventually start to express a political voice. And they will start demanding to have their needs addressed. And that's going to filter into politics as politicians want their votes. A lot of these people are also immigrants. Well, this market revolution is not going to affect the South nearly as much as it affects the North. It's, nearly, it's not going to affect the South nearly as much as it affects the North. And this is largely because the capital is in the North. The money to invest tends to be Northern. That's where the banks are. That's where the John Jacob Astors of the world are. This is where most of the immigrants are going to start coming. And of course, the immigrants are going to be the labor for these factories. 
The immigration in the United States started in the 1830s, but it really picked up in the 19, I mean, excuse me, in the 1840s. And what we started to see was just thousands and thousands of European immigrants. Here is a map of the Irish population, for example, coming over to seek a better life in the United States. And these people were rural, poor peasants from Europe. The Irish are a particularly unique group because in the 1840s, there was a terrible famine in Ireland. It's known as the potato famine. The potato crop failed. And something like half the population starved. I'm not making that up. It was just absolutely devastating to the Irish people. And what was really tragic about it is the rest of the uh, uh, European people sort of sat back and let it let it take place. Yeah, there was plenty of food in Europe. There was just no food in Ireland. And so instead of shipping food to the Irish to feed them, the Europeans sort of sat back and let it happen. So that's the real tragedy there. But nevertheless, huge numbers of Irish start migrating in the 1840s. And they were environmental refugees. They are fleeing Ireland because they're starving. Somewhere in the neighborhood of 1.5 million migrated to Boston and New York during the 1840s. And the Irish in particular were not welcomed with open arms. You know, here, here's a sketch of, here's a sketch of uh, them coming off the boats. You know, again, these people are poor, they're starving, many of them are sick, they're almost universally illiterate, and so they were seen as not good people. You know, people that we don't want to see here, and it didn't help also that they were Catholic. And the United States is, at this time, not a, not a nation that likes Catholicism very much. We were very much an anti-Catholic nation, and so the Irish all being Catholic was also something that caused great concern. But one thing that the Irish were willing to do was go get jobs in these factories, and so they worked in, 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 in for very, very cheap wages. Um, New York City developed a tradition of having Irish police. You know, the police in New York City starting in the 1840s started to be Irish. And the reason is because being a policeman in, the, in New York City at that time was a really rough job. You know, it was a really, really, really dangerous, difficult job. You're getting in a fight about every other day with somebody, and of course the pay stinks. And so the Irish men were willing to do it. You know, the Irish men were willing to, to, to take these jobs. It was not considered uh, something very dignified. And that tradition of the Irish in the police force continued for generations, and the Irish would eventually take great pride in the sense that they served as the policemen in New York City, also Boston. There were also large numbers of, oh, here's uh, some anti-Irish newspapers. You know, the, news, the Irish were seen very poorly, and so they, they're, they're depicted in newspapers in some pretty, very racist caricatures. Anyway, the Germans also migrated. You know, there was a substantial amount of uh, Substantial amount of German migration. The Germans were not as disliked as the Irish. You know, the Germans tended to be welcomed a little bit more. Um, for one thing, the Germans weren't necessarily Catholic. The Germans were often Protestant because they came from North Germany, and so that was not seen as an issue. Also, the Germans tended to not want to live in cities. They tended to want to live in rural areas. You know, they wanted to become farmers too, and so they were able to get this land out west and break the soil and farm, and that was considered, you know, a very noble endeavor. Yes? I'm sorry, a little louder? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, of course, the, 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 the pull there was the fact that these, these industrialists want the labor, right? Some people did not want them because, again, these Irish, you know, they're racist. But then if you're a factory owner, you need, you need workers in your factories, right? And you want to pay as little as possible and so these immigrants will work for very, very, very low wages. And so the, the ports of Boston and the ports of New York were just wide open. Anybody can come right on over. And they would walk off the boats, and there would be representatives from the factories handing out cards. Okay, this is your job. Monday morning, Monday morning, Monday morning, Monday morning. Uh, your, your job is told to you the minute you get off the boat. And then the next step, somebody says, and you're voting for this person, and you're voting for this person, and you're voting for this um, And so, you know, you're going to take this job, and you're going to vote for this person, and that's the way it is, right? Bit of a corrupt place. Cities would develop neighborhoods based on different ethnicities. You know, there would be the Irish neighborhood, and there would be the Jewish neighborhood, and there would be the, um, 
you know, Polish neighborhood, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a movie called Gangs of New York that came out about 20 years ago uh, that has a, you know, and, and this idea of the different neighborhoods and how they didn't necessarily get along and, and how they sort of fought over territory was, was the center of that movie. And if you think about it, it matters because, of course, if a factory is only going to hire Irish people and you're not Irish, you're not happy about that, right? Or if a factory decides to exclude one group over the others, and so, and so they, they form these identities. An Italian neighborhood, there were a lot of Italian immigrants that came in, bringing their culture with them as well. And so America is becoming kind of an interesting place. America is becoming kind of an interesting place. Um, in the 1850s, it's worth noting that the Chinese are going to start migrating to California. Now, we're getting ahead of things. You know, we're getting ahead of ourselves. California is on the other side of the continent, and we don't even have California yet. But just know that pre-Civil War immigration was not entirely European. You know, Pre-Civil War immigration also involved Asians. And it's an open knowledge that the Chinese helped build California. You know, all of the hard construction work, the infrastructure work, building the railroads, as they say, was done by Chinese peasant labor, with these Chinese people coming over and establishing communities. That's why San Francisco has what? Chinatown. Yeah, Chinatown in San Francisco is the biggest Chinatown uh, because the Chinese have been there since before San Francisco was San Francisco. So that's why that's such a big deal out there. Anyway. It's also worth noting that these cities were dangerous, crowded, very, very different than what they had been a generation earlier. You know, all of these immigrants coming in and the factories and all of this uh, change is making New York and Boston and Philadelphia and the like, they, they look very, very different in a very short period of time. And a lot of this was not good. You know, diseases such as typhus, dysentery, Malaria, yellow fever, you know, these sort of ran through these cities in, in huge numbers, one year after the next. There was a lot of crime. I don't need to tell you that. You know, all these people coming in, they're poor, they're desperate, they're uneducated. There's going to be gang activity. There's going to be all types of criminality that takes place. There's going to be good old-fashioned American racism. A lot of these immigrants were not particularly tolerant toward blacks. And so free blacks living in places like New York and Philadelphia would have to form their own organizations to look out for themselves. Now, why would the Irish be known to be racist against blacks? Why would an Irishman have, I mean, why would he have anything to do against, uh, have anything against a free black? What would be the problem there? Yeah, they're competing for work. That's exactly right. They're competing for work because the Irishman shows up and says, I'll dig that ditch. And the black guy shows up and says, I'll dig that ditch. Pretty good chance I'm hiring the black guy, you know, because he's an American. I know who he is. And, you know, this Irish guy, I'm not so sure about it. So the Irish found themselves very threatened by free black uh, labor. Yeah, you had a question? Uh, yeah. So um, I was just thinking, since the um, Irish immigrants and the And that's a great question. That's a great question. And the, the short answer is, generally speaking, the children would go to work in factories as well, which we're going to address here in just a minute, right? And if they did not work in the factories, you know, the children that didn't work in the factories, to be honest with you, were often <laughs> had to figure it out, right? And these communities sort of had to rely on each other for what we would call childcare. Um, there's a real interesting book that addresses that very topic. Now, this was about um, a little bit later, the early 20th century, but it's the same kind of idea. You know, you have these very tightly packed ethnic neighborhoods. All of the families have to go to work. What do you do with the children? And it goes without saying the Irish tend to have a lot of children, right? Uh, so do the Italians. Um, and this author actually interviewed elderly people that had grown up in the early 20th century in these immigrant communities where it's kind of a free-for-all, what do you really do with the kids? And he came to conclude that it really wasn't all that bad, that these communities looked after their children and that everybody sort of relied on everybody else and the kids figured it out. And there was a level of independence that children had that we would consider horribly dangerous today, but they worked it out and that actually it turned out to be not so bad. Was going to school like a thought that anyone ever had? We are just about to talk about it, the public school, because you you would have fit right in, because that's exactly what other people were thinking, too. Hey, these kids need to be in school, right? 
Um, and I'll just bring up very, very quickly on that note, what do you do with the kids, right? There is a nation today that's still kind of, you know, you, you look and you think these people aren't watching the kids and that's Japan. You know, children in Japan are sent to school on public, y'all know what I'm talking about, on public transportation. And you will go through like Tokyo subway stations with millions of people walking everywhere and all these little bitty children completely on their own know which subway to get on. Everybody's looking after them. They're not in any real danger. You know, these little kids just walk to school on the subway. No adults, right? Um, and Japanese culture sort of adapts to the idea that we all watch out after the children, you know, and, and children can navigate the subway and the children feel comfortable asking for help if they need it. But yeah, you know, Americans are helicopter parents. You know, Americans, you know, we put an iron umbrella over our kids and don't let anything you know, fall on it, but other cultures don't work that way. So yeah, I'm, yeah. Um, another country that I, as I understand, really kind of lets the kids run wild is Spain. You know, the Spanish will just open the doors and those kids will just run off and just be gone. I'm big cities in Spain. Um, and they'll just come back later and it's like, where you been, right? And yeah. And I'm not talking like in the suburbs, like when your own neighborhood on your block where you rode your bike around the block. I'm talking like downtown Madrid, right? And little children are just kind of everywhere as I understand it. And Spanish culture, everybody sort of watches everybody's kids and it's not considered to be unusual. Yeah, it is crazy, yeah. I've heard that like in, in Spain, and again, I'm not so sure, but I, in Spain, it's like, okay, um, and, you know, they, they tend to do everything a little bit later. You know, dinner in Spain is, is, is late at night. They, they eat dinner at like eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night. Like you'll like, your kids will just like run off in Madrid and eat with people that you don't even know. And like, like your family is eating, they'll see like, hey, come on over here, you know, hey, hey Nino, come over here, eat, you know, and, and they're just like, okay, you know, and everybody just kind of hangs out. I, I don't know. It, it sounds so foreign. Yeah, well, it is foreign, I guess, but uh, that's how the culture is, you know, that's, that. and then of course, if they were to look at us, what do they think that we protect our children too much? You know, we shield them too much from, from the real world, and they argue that our children grow up not really prepared to interact and not really prepared to deal with the way the world works because we don't let them navigate these things by themselves so yeah my mom used to tell me when she was a kid they were allowed to just yeah go out and do whatever and not have to worry but now it's like well we have to draw a distinction between um american suburbs versus the big cities right because and, and you're right you know and like when i was a kid you know i would go out and play with my friends but see we always stayed in the neighborhood and i know y'all know what i'm talking about right you know we didn't leave the, the block that we lived on so mom and dad didn't really care because they knew where i was um but uh yeah yeah there's yeah, be home by the, yeah, when the light, when the street lights come on, come home, right? That's kind of the, that's kind of the thing. Um, but uh, yeah, no, other cultures that are much more urbanized, I mean, they, they don't, I mean, it's, it's very, very different. It's very, very different. No, I'm not sure that I agree with that book, though, by the way, um, because there's a lot of questions about, you know, who exactly, I mean, the, the kids that ended up getting killed aren't obviously going to be interviewed, right? So the survivors were the ones, so I don't know, it's hard to say. But uh, in any way, in this environment, you kind of get where it was. It was a very different place. Anyway, moving forward. Uh, with this, and you're on the right topic, I'm glad you brought it up, reform movements are going to emerge. Now, the term, yeah, 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 yeah exactly, yeah. It's, it's like, I might as well, it's like, here, here are my notes. Uh, um, I want to use the term Native American. I'm not talking about American Indians. I'm talking about a different concept. Um, Native American in the context that I'm talking about right here is a person who was born and raised in the United States, basically your typical white guy, okay? Like a white family, not an immigrant family. Like, you know, the Irish and the uh, Italians are white people, but they're not Native born Americans. Y'all get where I'm coming from. And so there is a concern by the 1830s that the Native American culture is under threat by all of these immigrants coming in, that, that what makes the American people American, not indigenous Americans, but the others, uh, is somehow changing. And there was a move to quote unquote, assimilate these people and turn them into American Americans. You know, you're Irish, but you know, your children are gonna be American. You're Italian, but we're gonna teach your children to be American, you get the idea. And so reform movements are gonna to emerge to try and assimilate these populations and also address a number of the obvious problems 
that we can see associated with this urbanization. Um, and one of these reform movements is the push for public education. And the father of public education is Horace Mann, and he was deeply concerned that all of these children in all of these cities are working in factories or just running around on the streets all day. In his mind, they belonged in school. They needed to become literate Americans. They needed to be taught to become Native Americans. And in his mind, we have an opportunity to raise an entirely new generation that is vastly more prosperous and well-off than earlier people. And that is because we can, we can raise the first generation that is completely literate. And so he pushes for public schools. The first public school, of course, pushed by him, opened in 1827 in Massachusetts. And it didn't take long before laws in Massachusetts were making public education mandatory. Not only are these schools open for children, but all children must attend. Your families will not have a choice. You don't get to opt out. Yes? How did they find teachers? Because well, that's what we, yeah, that's the challenge, right? Because you have to hire teachers, and that means you have to and invest. They also have to learn that. That's right, and you have to invest in higher education so you can train teachers. Exactly. It's an expensive, slow process, right? And then, of course, you know, you'll start in an area where we can gather a few teachers, and then we'll, we'll grow out from there. And eventually, of course, we'll have to see the professionalization of education because somebody might be literate, somebody might be well educated, but they don't necessarily have the skills to be a good teacher. You see what I'm saying? And what does it really mean to be well educated at this point? Because there's no standardization of higher education. So you might have gone to a school that was good or a school that was substandard. We don't know. So no one married Well that's why it was in Massachusetts. Remember Massachusetts is more literate than other places. And so you can find people there. But it's also worth noting in, in that um, female school teachers were expected to be young and women were not expected to be school teachers after they got married. And so the earliest primary school teachers were unmarried single women. It was considered inappropriate for a married woman to take a job outside the home because she has her own children to raise. And so one, and I'm not kidding, it was law. If you become married, you can't be a school teacher anymore. You have to, and that was, that was a common law up through the 19th century, I mean, even into the early 20th century, uh, only single women were expected to be teachers, and also men. You know, men were expected to become, were also uh, uh, open to the idea, uh, uh, or it was open to the idea of having male school teachers as well. They can be married, right, because, you know, that's, we can't have a fair world, right, as that wouldn't, that wouldn't work. Um, but the idea of the schoolmaster, you know, the, the, the man sort of, you know, playing a role was also important. Women were typically considered to, to be the proper school teacher for primary children. Men were considered to be the proper school teachers for older children, for teenagers and, and, and secondary education. And of course, girls were not expected to go to school as long as boys. You know, girls were expected to get a primary education. Boys were expected to go further because girls are supposed to get married and become moms. So you have that, you know, that dual idea of the man as the breadwinner and the woman as the housewife. You get the idea. Certainly not something we would celebrate today, but their heart's in the right place, I guess, right? You know, they're on, they're on the right track. And now it's revenge of the ladies. I think we've talked about that already. You know, y'all are totally winning the race in higher education. Y'all are outnumbering the guys two to one. And I'm sorry, fellas, the girls are better than you as students. They are. They make better grades. They just do. I don't know how else to put it. The girls are winning, which is fine by me. Let somebody else take over, right? Um, Anyway, public schools are going to spread in the 1830s and the 1840s, again, more in the north than in the south, and the mandatory aspect of it is something I want to emphasize because the idea was to turn these immigrant children into American children, and we're not going to do it if their families are uncooperative, and so if you are, say, an Italian family, you might not like the idea of your child being sent to an American school and taught about George Washington and taught how they're supposed to be American and forget all about you know, Italy and all that, you know, primitive Italian culture you come from and completely change your kids, you might not be too keen on that. And so school had to be mandatory and the curriculum was very much geared toward assimilation, turning them into real Americans. Another movement that emerges is the temperance movement. 
And temperance is simply another word for no alcohol. Temperance is another word for no alcohol. Americans drank an awful lot during this time. There's just no other way to put it. Americans typically consumed four times more alcohol per capita than today. You know, in 1820, the average American consumed four times the amount of alcohol as, as today. Now, a lot of that had to do with the fact that, again, we don't necessarily have access to running water. And so in cities, they drank a lot of beer rather than water. Uh, we mentioned earlier farmers would frequently distill their excess corn and excess grain into whiskey, so somebody's got to drink it. So part of it just simply had to do with the cuisine, but there's just no getting around it. Lots and lots of alcohol. Um, immigrants, accurately or inaccurately, were typically pegged as the people who drink the most, you know, the Irish and the Italians and whatnot. Cities were absolutely full of bars and taverns and people just getting knee-walking drunk every single night. Factory owners were very concerned about this because, of course, if you run a factory, you want your workers to be sober. It's a bad idea to have these guys staggering around drunk on the factory floor, and that was a real problem. And so the temperance movement emerges where alcohol is now seen as evil and something that needs to be either reduced or eliminated as part of our society. The first anti-alcohol organization was the American Temperance Society, and it was founded in 1826. Now, the question that it has to decide is should alcohol be discouraged or should there be laws making it illegal? Those are two different issues if you think about it. You know, it's a one thing for me to ask you not to drink. It's another thing for me to make it illegal. And eventually the temperance movement will begin to push to make it illegal. This was no longer going to be something that they hope people voluntarily quit doing because they figured out very quickly that asking people to quit drinking doesn't seem to work. So they will begin to push alcohol as anti-family, anti-American, anti-everything. And this fear of all of these immigrants is going to cause the temperance movement to grow. Because as I, as I already mentioned, the immigrants are seen as people who abuse alcohol far more than Native Americans. And so if we're going to turn them into good old-fashioned Americans, we got to get the alcohol out of them. Another reform movement is going to involve asylums, prisons, and prostitution. Asylums, prisons, and prostitution. One individual behind this is a woman by the name of Dorothea Dix. And she is one of the first to recognize mental illness as a legitimate disease. You know, these mentally ill people need help. We should be sympathetic. This is not some sort of character flaw. And that there are different types of mental illness. And of course, some people are so mentally ill that they cannot take care of themselves and they cannot function in society. And rather than demonize them and try to just sort of lock them up, we should try to give them help. Now, once we start having cities that grow, big cities like, again, New York and Boston, they also become places where mentally ill people tend to concentrate. You know, before this was something that could sort of politely be overlooked and every community would have a few people that fell into this category and it was sort of taken care of as a family affair. And frequently, and this is horrible, but frequently these people would simply be run out of town and they would live in the woods and whatnot. I know that's awful, but it would happen. Well, Dorothea Dix spearheads the construction of asylums. 
places where mentally ill people can go where they will be treated, at least in theory, with dignity and as people who have real illnesses. Now, I don't need to tell you that these early asylums were not pleasant places. You know, this is a long way away from genuinely humane care. You know, the last thing you want to do is be living in a 19th century insane asylum. You know, that's the kind of stuff Stephen King writes about. But her heart's in the right place. Her heart's in the right place. we got to get the ball started somewhere, and Dorothea Dix does that. And what we will eventually do is see state-funded asylums, and eventually this will translate into a field of medicine where psychiatrists and psychologists will take up mental illness as a legitimate disease with an attempt to cure it. Now, the reality is it's bewilderingly difficult to try and help people that are, you know, really mentally ill. We still don't really have much of a cure for any of it. We can just give them drugs to slow down their brain but that's about all we can really do. What is the most uh, notorious way of treating mentally ill people? And this became a big deal in the 20th century. What would they do to people who, we're talking about severely mentally ill people. Uh, what was the, what would eventually become the, the standard practice? Anybody know? Like what would they do? If, if, if somebody is genuinely like seriously paranoid, schizophrenic or something like that. And they go crazy, like kind of if, if, Yes, what would they do? Lobotomy. The lobotomy would become a common practice for people with severe mental illness, and that's whenever they would, I'm not making this up, stick a spike up through your eye socket into your frontal lobe and take out a chunk of your brain and pull it back out. While they're alive? While they're awake. Um, and what it does is it just pretty much shuts down your personality. And people, once you have a, a frontal lobotomy, um, you just become calm. It gives you brain damage to the point where you just you're chill, right? And you don't cause problems anymore. You also don't have much mental activity after that. But the idea is if you're absolutely beyond help and you're hurting yourself and you're hurting others and there's no possible way to take care of you, they concluded that was the only other legitimate option. And the lobotomy actually was a thing all the way up to into the 1970s. The lobotomies are still, the man that, the man that developed the lobotomy won the Nobel Prize for it. Yeah. Well, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna play devil's advocate, okay? What would you do in its place? You got to come up with a solution. You're the doctor. You see what I'm saying? Put them in a, um... But I, I mean, if you if you're looking at somebody and you put them in a straitjacket and they're hitting their head against the wall all day and they're obviously you know in torturous uh, uh, misery, you tell me what's what's the well, preferred option. And those are the only two choices you have. Remember, today we don't do lobotomies because we have drugs to give them. Right? We can give people drugs that'll just keep them calm all the time. But they didn't have that back then, right? And so the lobotomy was actually seen as something humane because there's nothing else that you can do. See, I've seen rooms where there's cushion. Yeah, the, the yeah, the rubber room with the yeah. But of course, imagine if if you were imagine if that was you all the time, if that was the only place you could be, you know. And so they concluded that you know we just got to lobotomize these people to to give them a a degree of peace, and it's horrible. I mean, I don't know the answer, right? I don't have an answer, but that's what they were thinking. Yep, yeah, go through the eye socket. Go, uh, they pull it out. Blind? No, no, they, they, they were able to. Yeah. Um, brain surgery that deals with people whose you know brain is not working right. You got to think about it. I mean, again, you can either use surgery or you can use drugs. And if they don't have the drugs, then they've got to do that. There's there are other surgeries that they do, like people that have severe seizures all the time. Um, they'll go in and, and sever uh, the, the connection between the, the right and the left, like it's a corpus callosum or whatever. Um, and what that does is it is it oftentimes stops seizures. And it also can affect the way you think. But again, if you're having multiple seizures all, all the time every day, uh, it's seen as a, as a more humane option. They still do that today. That's kind of like a lobotomy, right? And they, you know, so, yeah. Taking a chunk out of your brain, yeah. that don't kill you. No, it doesn't kill you. If you do it the right way, well, I'm sure that some people die from it. I'm, I'm going to just go out on a limb and say that didn't, you know. Um, they lobotomized one of John Kennedy's sisters. Yeah, President Kennedy had a sister who they lobotomized, yeah. And the real problem with it is obviously the abuse of it, right? Because not only, I'm, I'm not going to get into the controversy of doing it to anyone, obviously, but it gets worse because they were known to do it to people who probably didn't need it. You know, someone who's just a troublemaker. They probably just sneeze and, oh, they're having 
Well, there's a movie. There's a movie that deals with that issue, and it's called One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Has anybody heard of that movie before? It's, yeah, it was a book, and it's called. Yeah, you've heard of it. Yeah, Jack Nicholson starred in it. And he won an Oscar for it, and it's called One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And it's a movie that addresses mental illness, and we need to have a humane, but nonetheless professional adult conversation about how do we address mental illness in our society. Because you can't just say this is a horrible thing that they're doing with them without coming up with your own solution, right? What do we do when somebody is, is, is in such a serious state? Um, and it went flew over the cuckoo's nest. I'll just go ahead and, and give it away. Um, he is a criminal who got off by pretending to be mentally ill, but he's actually not mentally ill. I mean, he just he just pled insanity and they, they gave him that as a plea bargain. And so he's actually kind of a not such a nice guy, but not really mentally ill. And he ends up in an asylum with people who genuinely are. And so he then has to navigate that. Um, yeah, because it was either prison or an, or an asylum. And so he pled, you know, he was able to plea bargain and, you know, not guilty by reason of insanity. Well, they eventually lobotomized him. Um, but uh, that's, it, yeah. And the movie, I think the movie won Best Picture, and I think Nicholson won like an Oscar for Best Picture. Yeah. It's, and it's a neat book. It's a really, really good book because it addresses mental illness. And it forces you to actually have to think about all the issues. You can't just say, this is a terrible thing to do. You have to say, okay, I have to look at all of my options and pick one. And unfortunately, there is no good option. That's the problem. There's no option where we can all agree, you know, everything is fine. You know, one way or the other, if you're the doctor that has to treat this patient, you have to come up with a solution. If, if it's a lobotomy, it's a lobotomy. We don't have anything else to do. So that's where it becomes very controversial. I don't know. It's... It's it's unfortunate, but oh, and what that was a good movie. You know, it's you know Jack Nicholson was already a big star, but it's kind of his. It's well, it's not his signature performance. He's got several of those, but if you want to know why Jack Nicholson is such a big movie star, that's that's the movie that one of the movies to watch. Dorothea Dix is saying, okay, we have to address this. We have to deal with this. Uh, this is not something that we can just simply ignore uh, anymore. You know, we have to we have to professionally take a stand and, and try to help people uh, that, that need this kind of help. And we can also be very grateful, right, that, that uh, if, if we are fortunate enough not to have these conditions. Um, and that's a big step, right, because if you think about it, society did not deal with mentally ill people very well, uh, and by many respects, I guess, still doesn't. Um, let's talk about prisons. Here's another one that's very unpleasant to think about, but what do we do with criminals? What do you do with people that just simply will not follow the rules, right? Lock them up, right? But of course, does locking them up really solve anything? Well, you know, not really, because when they get out of prison, they just go commit crimes again, right? Um, and so as cities start to grow, and again, we have these big cities, we start to see criminal behavior that just simply cannot be overlooked. Now, prior to this, we really didn't have prisons in this country. You know, people that committed crimes were generally punished on the spot. You know, we would whip them publicly or put them in the stocks or something like that. But the idea of removing them from society, excuse me, from society altogether was seen as unproductive because if that man is married, if that man has children, uh, he's got to get back to work, right? Because when you, when you take somebody away like that, you're also punishing the people that rely on him uh, for, their, for their livelihood. And so locking a man up was not seen as something that would be positive. Now, some societies did have penal colonies, you know, right? And, and you know, Britain, for example, uh, as we all know, used Australia as a penal colony. You know, the people that we just want to get rid of, we're just going to put them on a boat, ship them to Australia, and they never get to come back home. Uh, that's one way to get rid of people, right? And, when, uh, and, and they also, by the way, sent a lot of those criminals to the U.S. The prisons are going to start emerging as a way to get these people out of society without having to ship them to Australia. And I don't know that we have ever really figured out what prisons are for, right? Are they there to punish you? Are they there to reform you? Are they there to just keep you away from society so you can't cause any problems? Um, one of the biggest problems with letting people out of prison is they tend to go commit crimes again, right? We know that the vast majority of serious crimes are committed by people who already have criminal records and you know, real serious crimes are generally committed by people who have already done time. And so, you know, we made a mistake by letting them out, I guess. But at the same time, you know, how do we how do we deal with it? And I don't know that we've ever really solved that problem, have we? You know, it's a, it's a, not an easy solution, not an easy solution. Um, prostitution, another issue that 
uh, on. another issue that does not have an easy solution to it. Um, prostitution has been around since antiquity. It is the world's oldest profession. You know, that is the, the nickname for it. There has always been prostitution in society, and almost certainly there always will be. Uh, up to this point, prostitution was not something that was talked about in polite society. Uh, every community would have its sex workers. Uh, these people were generally uh, uh, on the margins of society, and the idea of who actually patronizes them uh, was, was something that was uncomfortable. And so the idea was that, you know, we don't really talk about the fact that the men are going to see these prostitutes. Well, once again, big cities, lots of immigrants, lots of poor people, lots of desperation. We're going to see a rise in prostitution. And it's going to start becoming so obvious that it has to be addressed. And so there's movements to try to figure out what do we do? Do we criminalize it? Do we try to legalize it? Um, do we try to regulate it? Um, the uncomfortable reality is that the myth that it was all just a bunch of poor people and immigrants was not necessarily true. You know, people from all classes in society would visit prostitutes. And also the idea that prostitutes are themselves criminally minded or, or somehow evil also uh, w w was, was a myth. You know, many times the women that are, that are working as prostitutes are doing it out of desperation. They don't have an option. You know, they're starving, they have children to support, their husbands have died or left them or whatever, uh, and they definitely do not want to be doing this, but it is the only way that they can get money to feed their children or that sort of thing. Um, and it's also worth noting, not all the prostitutes were women. Uh, you, you know, there were also men that fell into that category as well. You can sort of figure that one out for yourself. Um, and that was something people really didn't want to talk about, but it's got to be addressed. You know, what do we do with this? And so by the 1830s and 1840s, society is finally having to acknowledge that this is worth discussing. Um, and it all gets down to the fact that these big cities are compounding the problem. Another reform movement, women's rights. You know, what role should women play in a modern society? Does the traditional dual role household, where the husband is the breadwinner and the wife is the homemaker, fit the modern era? And so beginning in the 1840s, we will see the emergence of what we call the women's rights movement. And let me tell you, this is nowhere near as simple as we would like it to be. First and foremost, the notion that traditional society has had the husband is the breadwinner and the wife is a homemaker is in and of itself a myth. You will recall 97% of society were rural farmers, right? Well, I can assure you mom is out there working the fields right alongside dad. And so there really never was this separation of labor that was easy to demarcate. Women are, you know, again, women are doing the agricultural work alongside their husbands. That's how yeoman families work. You see, only the very wealthy, only the truly well-off could afford to have mom not bring in income. And so women's rights movement, the women's rights movement was geared around the idea of women getting actual recognition for the contribution that they're making. Everybody in the family seems to be working, but the husband seems to be the one with all of the agency and authority in the relationship. And women's rights activists argued, this is not good. This is not healthy. And of course, Again, big cities are bringing this forward because these immigrant families really saw this in a pronounced way. Uh, and it was something that they were deeply concerned about. But we're out of time because I'm going to pass the test back. So we'll talk about that on Thursday. Sound good? All right, everyone. Y'all take care. And if you want to see your test, uh, get in touch with me.